I am Dr. Zora Alam and welcome to American Legacy Season 175, the documentary series that fearlessly stumbles into the darkest corners of American history and hunts for the light switch because it really can't see a thing. It's very dark in there, you see. Our next documentary is from Lilith Midnight Umbra. Umbra has documented the 83 subcultures of the American goth community, including emo, industrial, Star Trek fans, and people who wear black because it goes with everything. Discover the hidden lives of American goths in dark and darker. So when I think about goth, I think about gothic architecture and cathedrals. As a Chicano goth, I have to say, uh, first off, si su puede. Anyway, I love the medieval torture. Also like witchy, witchcraft, voodoo. I feel like it all ties together. No. Okay. The darkness of it, I feel like that's what makes it beautiful. Oh, the Goths had a very rich history, just like the Vikings, a lot of travel. <laughs> the fall of Rome is attributed to them. And yes, they may have burned a village here or you know, pillaged a few houses or whatever. Who cares? It's fine. It's history. But if it was a Christian relic, they didn't touch it. They were very respectful in that way. It's, it's important that we all embrace the doors, that we embrace what he brought to the table, a skinny, twitching man who enjoys dancing to the beat of a drummer that isn't even in the building. What do I think about Jim Morrison? He's the Muppet guy, right? I love Miss Piggy. She's an icon. Well, you have, first you have your London goth, right? And if you, if you just want to get a little excerpt of that, turn on the 1980s vampire classic, The Hunger. It makes zero sense, uh, but David Bowie is very fuckable in it. David Bowie! Oh my God, I smoke too much weed. Anyway, delightful. Then you have over here on the West Coast, we don't really talk about Jim Morrison, but he was here. A lot of the early goth bands, they kind of came out of post-punk, so the band She's the Magazines, Joy Divisions, um, and it kind of evolved into its own genre, but it took a long time, probably at least a decade. And then there were different waves of goth. There was the heat wave and then the white wave because white people feel the need to be seen. Well, first off, I refer to opening the Bat Cave as sexual relations now. It was very important for people to come together in July of 1982 to pretend to be bats in a cave in London. Bats and goths have a lot of things in common. We're both dark, we're both misunderstood, we both get in the news for the wrong reasons. That that place had to be lit as hell. I would, oh my God, I, I could picture, like if I was living in London, me asking my mom, can I go to the bat cave? And she would be like, absolutely not. Like it's, it just sounds so cool. It's. What I love about like gothic, like n when we name things, we make it so mysterious. It's like, I've got to go to the Batcave. Like what, like what is this place? It's like inviting, but like underground. But you know, when you get there, you're going to feel secure. It was, I was a month and, and 11 days old. And even I knew as an infant how important that moment truly was. It was sort of like our American bandstand moment, uh, but more inside of a, a, a dark London club, but way more cocaine. It was a lot of fun. I love the 80s. Oh, if I could be in a time, it would be the 80s. Iconic bands performed at the Batcave. You have Bauhaus. Southern Death Cult, UK Decay, The Damned. You also have Doc Martin in Seoul. 
bat nose. Pleather will do. Sex with death. This eyeliner was a lip liner. Um, cheese pie. French dish. Root and toot and good time. Raccoon party, that's who it was. Oh, so underrated. God. How my law practice uh, specializes in goth rights and then also overlapping rights. For example, polyamory, the often discriminated against which, which parent is going to show up to the PTA meeting. We don't know, but we do know they're going to be in crushed velvet and leather. Goths are often discriminated in the workplace. You know, they allow dogs in offices. But why can't we bring our support ravens? It started with Dungeons and Dragons. You know, that game that basically wrote Stranger Things. Just a device for role play and storytelling. Yet somehow people got it in their minds that this would become the gateway to actual Satan. Which, if I only knew the gateway to actual Satan, I wouldn't be here right now. It then became part of the satanic panic. If your kids are playing Dungeons and Dragons, then they're gonna end up, I don't know, freebasing cocaine and sacrificing their pets to the devil. It then uh, developed into a full widespread panic. It ended up on Donahue and Sally Jesse Raphael, and that led to parents cracking down on their creative, spooky children and, and telling them, no, put that eyeliner down, no. Take that leather coat off. No, listen to the Osmonds. And they didn't have to. As we know, that is a downward spiral not written by Trent Reznor. You have to allow children to breathe. The more you tell them not to listen to something, the more they're gonna listen to it. One of the interesting turns that the satanic panic took was a book named Michelle Remembers where Michelle remembered lies. It did not happen. It was just a book about how a little girl just was abducted by a satanic cult and tortured by a satanic cult and how she somehow survived and forgot and then a, a brave hypnotist sort of pulled it out of her brain like it wasn't a complete fabrication. Which by the way are still happening today, <clears throat> Teal Swan, gruesome satanic rituals that didn't exist. That led to the police, believe it or not, taking satanic workshops that didn't even involve black candles or tarot cards. How can you have a satanic workshop without work, spellcraft, witchcraft, nothing? It was just them talking about how to bully poor goth kids on their way to school. And they continue to do this today. She basically led the entire country into believing that everyone, every little child, was going to get abducted by the Dark Lord, which would have been better. Most of our parents in the 80s didn't even know where we were. There were commercials that said, it's 10 o'clock, where are your children? Satan would know where they were. How do I feel about goths being bullied? Well, you have to be bullied. It builds character. It depends on who your bully is. If your other bully is a really sick person, it's an honor. I definitely bully other types of goth, but it comes from the heart. My mom bullied me all the time because it was hard to clean, all that lace and velvet, you know, and I wanted to keep it nice, it's expensive. You know, and yeah, maybe I spent a little too much on makeup and, you know, tried to pretend I was a vampire and swoop down on people. And But I mean, what kid doesn't go through a phase like that? You know, everybody goes through their like, look at me, I can fly, I'm a blood-sucking, vampire bat face, like it's, it's common. She just never understood, you know, I think she wanted somebody who was like, like a prom queen type, you know, peppy and, and, and smiley and bubbly and, and I liked, you know, death and violence and gore. And honestly, I think it helped me be more real about life, you know? We're all gonna die. Some of us are just more excited about it than others. All the old goths and punks are so funny because they sit there and they say things like, she looks good. I think she's off the heroin. She looks good. She's 70. Oh, 
Technology has changed goth culture for the better. I mean, there are so many subcultures of goths. You're seeing uh, people on, honestly, have you been on goth talk, TikTok, but goth? Uh, delightful. Uh, not only can you learn about new goth bands there, which I love, you also have great tutorials about how to seduce your goth girlfriend, which is mostly going to Hobby Lobby and buying up all the Halloween decorations and then putting them in a pentagram like circle in front of your house and, and getting a lot of cats. We are pro-diversity because we have a main enemy, Wall Street and freeform TV shows. The Disney goth. They were employees that were discriminated against because they chose uh, religiously to only work at the Haunted Mansion. Freeform TV shows is like if you put a fairy tale and a girl starting her period together. Yes, I am in steampunk, so what of it? If the rise of goths happened in the 60s and 70s, the Victorian times happened before that, and steampunk is a subset of goth, yes, but it's from a time period that happened before the goths ever came to, to fruition or whatever the word may be. Um, I would bully a lot of pastel goths because they can bounce back. I mean, look at them, they're so adorable. Um, them and uh, cyberpunk goths because, I mean, we're all living in a fantasy land, but what is that? Cyberpunk genres, right? So we've gone a long way from William Gibson to then Ghost in the Shell, to the Wachowski siblings, and now to, I don't know, whatever weird remake they cast a white lady for. Oh, fetish goth is interesting because it does touch on a lot of things that OG goths like. It just pushes it a little bit further. It's kind of, well, it's not like regular goth is something you'd want to talk to your parents about anyway, but it's something you really don't want to talk to your parents about. Like, really, really. Like, if you don't want to talk to your parents about your goth thing to start with, like, you really, really, really don't want to talk to them about your fetish goth thing. It's basically, it's a goth's world and everyone else just lives in it. Have you seen RuPaul's Drag Race lately? It's just basically goths going to the club. It's pretty sassy. I enjoy it. Slay, but like with a, a sickle. Actually, slay. Kill. Murder. Culture, I see us going even more mainstream than we are right now. And it might piss us off a little bit. <laughs> you know, we're going to see it. We're going to see it in movies. We're going to see it on, on TV. We're going to see it in billboards. But we need to take it and make it a safe space for us instead of Oh, capitalism's trying to jock our style. They want to, you know, they they weren't goth in the 80s. We need to take it and we need to make it more accessible and more comfortable and more inviting. And I think that that's definitely where it's heading, especially with my brand, Glam Goth Beauty. I want everyone to know that, yeah, you may not, goth culture may not be your thing, but this is a safe space for you. And if you are, you know, feeling dark and mysterious and sexy, or you have an event where you wanna go, you wanna, you know, have that energy, you can come to my safe space and find something there for you. And I think that that's what's gonna happen in fashion. It's gonna happen in food, it's gonna happen at the club, it's gonna happen at beaches, it's gonna be everywhere. And I'm very excited. I just hope I live that long to see it. I would just say that there is nothing wrong with you. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you. You like what you like. It's your life. Fuck everyone. Keep doing you. Period. <laughs> okay. And then I would do this. <laughs> as, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the Goths really held Christianity in high regard. And you know, the greatest Christian leader of all, Jesus, he loved goths so much that he would wear spikes. I mean, that's what we wear. It symbolizes that. His love of goth culture and goth people. I do. I do give Jesus props. He knew us. He was marginalized. He understood. <laughs>